Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to pick up in verse 13 and go to the end of the chapter. The power of the gospel, that's to my mind a good encapsulation of what we're going to cover in these few verses to kind of warm us up to where we are. Um, Remember that in uh, Paul's writing this letter, obviously, to the believers in Thessalonica, a relatively young church, a church that's suffering a lot of persecution. As we're going to see at the end of our uh, passage tonight, Paul really wants to go and visit them personally, but he has not been able to do so. But he writes this letter to encourage them. In the first chapter, he really describes who they are as a church. And what we see is a picture of a really thriving church. And then as you get into chapter 2, the first portion, uh, Paul then reminds them of how he and Timothy and Silas, uh, that's sort of the ministry team on this second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul, he reminds them all the things that, that they ministered to them, the way they conducted themselves, how they shared the gospel with them, loved them, uh, ministered the truth to them. And so now as we get into verse 13, uh, we're going to see uh, what are really just incredible expressions of joy and thankfulness. Paul's going to talk about how the, these people in Thessalonica, how they responded to the gospel. In other words, they heard the word of God and it changed them. It had a huge impact, a radical effect on them. And this church was was born. You know, they were literally born again of the Holy Spirit. And and some of the passages tonight, these words, it's, Paul sounds like sort of a proud papa. You know, I mean, if you've been around a hospital room where there's a new baby and uh, everybody's just in awe of the baby and bragging about the baby. And so it's so cool. It's so amazing. The miracle of life. You know, the parents are just gushing about, about the new baby. And uh, you almost get that sort of feel as Paul is just giving thanks for the effect that the Gospels had in the lives of these people. So uh, we're going to begin uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Paul says, For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. So we're going to camp out on this verse for the first part of our study. But notice that Paul says, For this reason we also give thanks, or we also thank God without ceasing for you. For this reason. What reason is he giving thanks? Well, because in the previous verses, he had just expressed all of the love that he had poured into this church, that he and Timothy and Silas, under threat of persecution, under real difficulty, they had really invested um, their lives. They had really been bold to share the truth. And so because there was this personal investment, man, they're so thankful. Hey, God has done a work and, and you're still walking with the Lord. You know, it's fruit that remains. And so they're just giving thanks. Um, and we'll see this again at the end. We'll, we'll pick up that idea in the last verses. But, but notice that he also says here, he says, they're giving thanks because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it. And you welcomed it as the word of God. They received the word. We're going to break this down a little bit. If we're looking at the effect that the gospel had in the city of Thessalonica as an example of how the gospel works, then, then one of the first things is, you know, obviously it was preached, it was delivered, but then it was received. You know, people have to believe the gospel for themselves. They have to act on it by faith. And this, of course, is more than just an intellectual agreement. Well, I think Jesus did live. And I think he did do some amazing things. And it is pretty fascinating. All the prophecies that he fulfilled, that's very interesting. I think that's true. That's intellectual assent. That's agreeing intellectually. But that's not the same thing as 
putting your trust in Christ for salvation. That's not the same thing as being obedient to the gospel by faith. James 2 verse 19, where he talks about that real faith produces real action. And if it doesn't produce real action, then it's not real faith. As he unpacks that idea, he says there in James 2.19, he says, you believe that there is one God, you do well. <laughs> Even the demons believe and tremble. I mean, you see it in the Gospels. The demons knew who Jesus was. They trembled at his presence. They were subject to his power. But they were not obedient. They were not, you know, coming into the plan of redemption. They were not forgiven or restored or any of those things. They knew intellectually, right? So, so in that sense, a friend of mine used to call it demonic faith. It's possible to have demonic faith. That is, faith is just an intellectual assent, but isn't an action of, of belief and obedience. And, um, and so yet the Thessalonians, they had real faith. But the other truth that's implied here is that they, in, in that they received the gospel is we're reminded that belief is a choice. It's something you have to decide to do. Receiving is an action to be taken. I never saw a little kid on Christmas just shove his hands in his pockets. No, those hands are out. I want the gift. Give it to me. I want to rip that paper off. I don't want to dive into that box. Receiving is an action. And so many people come to the gospel, but their hands stay in their pockets. But, but it has to be received, and belief is a choice. I like to say it this way. Belief is not a rash. It's not an involuntary reaction to stimuli. Right? You wake up one day, you have a rash. Something happened, your body reacted to it. Belief doesn't work that way, but people talk about it as if that's how it works. They'll even say things like, well, I want to believe, but I just can't because I have a hang-up about this or I have a hang-up about that. That's an excuse, whether they realize it or not, not to believe. They're making a choice. Belief is a choice. Belief is an act of the will. That's why we're condemned for our unbelief because we are rejecting, we are choosing not to believe. And, and when people talk about this, sort of the, they, they're trying to put the, put the monkey on our back. They're trying to put the onus on us. Well, if you would just convince me, then I would believe. Obviously, I'm not believing because you haven't convinced me. And so if you would just do a better job, Christian, of making the truth plain, then more of us would follow your crazy ways or whatever. It's, it's completely wrong, right? No, you're called to make a choice and you are making a choice, right? That's how it works. So they recognized or they received the word of God. And then Paul specifies in the verse, he says, they recognized it as God's word, not as the word of men. I don't know about you, but when I hear the word of men, I tend to typically receive it with skepticism, <laughs> Right? well, I don't know, that might be true. I guess I could look it up and do some research or whatever. But, but when we receive the, receive the word of God, how are we to receive it? Well, as truth. So not with skepticism, but with trust. And they, they recognize that the gospel was or is the word of God. And, and I want to, this is a part where I want to kind of do a little deeper dive tonight and hang out here for just a minute. What does it mean to recognize that God's word is indeed God's word? What, what does it mean to recognize, or how do we recognize, that the Bible is God's word? How does it happen for a person to come to this conclusion? First, there has to be the work of the Holy Spirit to help people see spiritual truth. Recognizing that God's word is God's word is not just an intellectual exercise. It's not free of the intellect, but it's not only about the intellect. It is also a spiritual activity, and it requires the work of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16, verses 7 through 11, Jesus 
teaches the disciples about the work, the purpose, the activity of the Holy Spirit. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Jesus has just told them, I'm not going to stick around. I'm going to ascend to my Father. I'm going to go away. He said, but that's to your advantage. For if I do not go away, the Helper, capital H, a reference to the Holy Spirit, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him, personal pronoun, to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world. This is what the Holy Spirit does. He will convict the world. A, a, perhaps a better translation of that word that we render convict would be convince. I mean, convict is accurate, but it, it's more than just like make feel guilty is probably how we think about it. It also has the idea of convincing. He will convince the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me. That's the sin of unbelief because we have to choose to believe. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. The Holy Spirit is the one who opens people's eyes so that they see Jesus for who he really is. That he's the righteous one worthy to ascend directly into heaven because of his perfection. And of judgment, he convicts of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. So they recognize the work of Jesus and the defeat of death and victory over Satan, right? But these are spiritual truths, and it takes the Holy Spirit at work to reveal these things and open the person's eyes to them, which just tells us that we should always pray for the work of the Holy Spirit to open people's eyes to the truth, to the truth of God's Word. It's essential. It's essential. If we're going to recognize, so the Holy Spirit was at work in Thessalonica as Paul and Timothy and Silas shared. The Holy Spirit was convicting, convincing hearts and minds, right? Our commission is to preach the gospel. The Holy Spirit's work is to apply it to the heart and to open people's eyes. So this is essential for recognizing that God's word is indeed the word of God. The second thing is to recognize that God empowers and works through his word to change people's hearts. It's right there in the verse. He says, As it is in truth the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. It effectively works in you who believe. Notice, who does it work in? The people that believe. The people that respond. The people that obey. The Word of God goes to work inside of them. It's powerful. We'll read some verses about that in a few moments. But I, I want to give a little list here because there are many areas of evidence that we can objectively point to and say, this is why I believe that the Bible is God's Word. Well, why do you read, read that old Bible? Why an old dusty book? Right? And people will say, this, like, why do you? Well, we can give them objective evidence for why we believe the Bible is God's Word. First of all, we should recognize that the Bible claims to be God's Word. This label of, oh, this is the Word of God, that's not something that men just came up with. That's not just something that preachers said, oh, well, we need a book to talk about, so let's pick this one and call it God's Word. No, the book itself, and we would expect that if this truly is a divine message from God to men to reveal who he is and what he wants and what his plan is, we would expect him to say, hey, this is God talking to men. And indeed, he does over and over and over again in the book. And the book claims to be God's word. It claims to be inspired by God, the words of God. So if you're going to have an honest assessment about the Bible, you have to start from the place, well, this is what it claims for itself, right? This is what it claims for itself. This is not men's idea. This is the author's idea, the author being God himself. The second thing is that the Bible, another evidence that it's really God's word, is that the Bible is unified in its message, which is astounding because it's not just a book. It's a book of books. As we like to say, it's 66 books written by 40 authors over 
1,500 year span of time written on three different continents in three different languages. I mean, that makes the Marvel Cinematic Universe look pitiful in comparison. <laughs> what do they got, like 30 or 40 movies now? That's all they could do? 66 books, 40 authors, 1,500 years, three languages, three continents. And here's the kicker. There's no plot holes. It is a unified message. There aren't contradictions. The Bible speaks of the same issues in the same ways from beginning until end. It's a unified message. The idea that the Bible is full of contradictions is a myth. So the next time somebody says the Bible is full of contradictions, the proper response is, show me one. Show me one. Bring me to one. And then let me explain it to you. And then they're going to have to have an open mind. They're going to have to understand a little something about proper big biblical interpretation. But proper biblical interpretation is not just somebody's opinion. It's not a whim. It's a system. It's a process that's applied consistently to the whole text. And when you let God's word speak and say what it says, you find out it speaks the same thing in all these different places. So the Bible is unified in its message. The third evidence that the Bible is God's word is the incredible reality that it has been preserved through the centuries. It has been preserved like no other book in history. You could eliminate every copy, digital and physical, that exists today of the Bible and you could recreate it instantly just by the quotations that have been taken from it in other works. That's how prolific the Bible has been. That's, that's the extent of its use. But it has been preserved, and it has been accurately preserved. I mean, the classic example of this is the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Old Testament books of the Bible found in caves around the Dead Sea, anywhere from the last few centuries B.C., say down to 300 B.C., give or take. When these scrolls were discovered, significant portions of the Old Testament were compared to the then most recent copies, of the new, or most ancient copies of the Old Testament that we had on file. They were from 900 AD. That was the earliest copies that we had. And so when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, it was a thousand year gap. And when they compared the text a thousand years apart, you know what they found? It's the same. It's the same. God built in a whole system in his nation, a whole way of life, a whole calling of people just to copy his word and to keep it accurate. When you read in the New Testament of the scribes and the Pharisees, you know what the scribes did? They were copying the scriptures. It was a calling. It was a lifelong process. They were accurate. right? God preserved his word. What we have today is what was written by the original authors. And we have evidence of that. Now, on the New Testament side, we have manuscript evidence. We have pieces of parchments, of scrolls, where we have copies of the New Testament. There are over 5,800 pieces of manuscript written in the original Greek of the New Testament. There are more than 18,000 portions of New Testament text written in other languages like Latin or Aramaic or, or whatever. That's, over, that's almost just shy of 24,000 main pieces of manuscript that we have for the New Testament. How does that compare to other ancient books and texts? What kind of evidence do we have of them? Let me give you a quote. This all comes from a guy named Sean McDowell, an, an apologist. He says this. He said, how do the New Testament documents compare with other ancient books? 
a stack of existing manuscripts from the average classical writer. I mean, you could think of like Homer, right? The Iliad, the Odyssey, right? A stack of existing manuscripts from the average classical writer would measure about four feet high. Yet the New Testament manuscripts would stack to more than one mile high. Four feet, one mile. God has preserved his word. Fourth piece of evidence that the Bible is God's word. The Bible is historically and prophetically accurate as we would expect it to be if it's from God. The common uh, number given is that Jesus fulfilled more than 300 details of prophecy in his first coming, including the place of his birth, the time of his birth, the family he was born into, the nature of his birth, born of a virgin, his travel to Egypt as a child, his residence in Nazareth, all of these details Jesus fulfilled. And those are all things that were fulfilled by Jesus, and he wasn't even trying to fulfill them. He was too young. He was just in the system, if you will, right? But, but these things are accurately predicted by the Old Testament prophets. The Bible is accurate, prophetically accurate. Not to mention about the prophecies of Daniel, how he lays out world history, and you get accurate predictions, not just of the Babylonian Empire and the Medo-Persian Empire and the Greek Empire and the Roman Empire. He gives detailed descriptions about Alexander the Great. And you see other prophets, right? They give um, Nahum accurately predicts the destruction of Nineveh in detail. Uh, Ezekiel predicts the destruction of the city of Tyre in detail. I mean, things that, that no one could make up and get right. So the Bible is accurate historically. It's accurate prophetically. Um, it's also been proven to be accurate in these ways by archaeology. And I won't go into a whole list, but just give you a quote here. Uh, from the Jewish archaeologist Nelson Gluck. I'm going to say it Gluck. G-L-U-E-C-K. One of the top three archaeologists in history said the following. He said, No archaeological discovery has ever contradicted a single properly understood biblical statement. Any Mideast archaeologist will tell you that the Bible is by far the best and most accurate source of information when looking for something new. So the Bible is accurate. Fifth and finally, evidence that this is God's word. <clears throat> it is the evidence of changed lives. It is the evidence of change. Paul says, the word of God which works in you. And I don't even have to give you a list of evidence. I could just ask individual people in the room to stand up. And you could testify and say, I know it's God's word because it's changed me. And you could give us detail in your life of how your life is different from before Jesus to after Jesus. Right? Listen to what Jesus himself says to those who questioned him in his words. He said, my doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, that is, if anyone wants to do God's will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, or Jesus says my teaching, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. Jesus said of his own teaching, if you want to know if I'm from God, do what I say and you'll find out. If you have a heart to obey it, you're going to discover that it's truth. And we, I would take that statement of Jesus about his own teaching and say we could apply it to all of Scripture because Jesus endorsed all of Scripture, right? God's Word changes people, those who believe and obey. What is the power of God's Word? I'm just going to give you three verses before I move on. Number one, God's Word builds faith. These are verses that we know. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Why does God's word build faith? Seeing miracles, by the way, is exciting, but it does not build faith in the substantive way that God's word does. In John, early on, 
I didn't look it up for tonight's study, but I want to say around chapter 4, Jesus has been performing miracles, and the people are all excited, and the text says Jesus did not commit himself to, to them because he knew what was in man. He knew they were just excited about the activities, but their heart hadn't been changed and convinced because of faith in his teaching and who he was. So activity and miracles are exciting, but they don't produce faith like God's word produces faith. Why does God word, God's word produce faith? Well, first of all, the Holy Spirit goes to work through God's word. But, you know, it's God's word that reveals to us who God is and who we are and what the truth is and gives us evidence to believe him. Right? It's illuminating. It's instructing. It gives us real things to hold on to. So it builds faith. Secondly, God's word reveals who we are. And this is building on that. It reveals who we are. This is the power of God's word. When you read God's word, you see yourself. And the Holy Spirit reveals, this is you. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We don't even understand ourselves most of the time. Why am I angry? Well, you go read the Bible and you find out, ah, the reason I'm angry is because I'm selfish. Why am I fighting with my spouse? Where do wars and fights come from, right? Because of our desires for pleasure. I'm fighting because I want my own way. Ah, God's word is showing me this is the issue. I thought it was because I was right and she was wrong. Apparently not, right? It discerns between soul and spirit, between just fleshly things and spiritual things. God's word brings that clarity. It reveals. And the third thing is it keeps us from sin. Psalm 119, verse 9. How can a young man cleanse his way? Even the young have sins to deal with. How can they be right? How can they be transformed? David writes, by taking heed according to your word. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. It keeps us from sin. In the language of the New Testament, the renewing of the mind, the washing of the water of the word, it's transformative. So Paul is just rejoicing about this spiritual birth that's happened in these uh, Thessalonian believers. And he says it's because we delivered the word of God and because you received it as the word of God and it has been at work in you. Man, that's exciting. That's what we pray for. That's what we pray for our families and for our neighbors and for the work of the Spirit, that, that, that this would continue. And it does. It happens continually. But, but this is to be celebrated. And Paul is celebrating this with the Thessalonian believers. All right, I told you we're going to camp out there for a long time. Now let's finish the chapter. Um, <clears throat> uh, look at verse 14. Now, what was the result of their salvation? Verse 14. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have pers prosecute, or excuse me, persecuted us, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the uttermost." I just love that Paul doesn't write this ooey gooey letter and say, heard y'all are doing good. Hang in there. Praise God. Everything's happy. Be blessed. They're suffering under some real persecution and he doesn't avoid it. He says, I understand you're suffering some persecution, right? He just acknowledges it. It's real life. Don't listen to preachers that don't talk about real life. Paul says, but he wants to encourage them. He says, look, you've become imitators of the churches of God. In other words, you are just like the other believers. He wanted them to know that. The proof of their salvation, the proof of their witness was that they suffered persecution. And not just any persecution, Paul writes, 
the same persecution as the very first church, the one in Jerusalem, the one in Judea. They suffered the same as the original church. And Paul says the persecution you are suffering is evidence of your genuine faith. It's the same persecution suffered by the prophets, suffered by Jesus, suffered by us, the apostles. You're in good company. And that would be a comfort to them, right? Hearing that would tell these Thessalonian believers that their situation was not strange. No need to panic or think that something's wrong. Thessalonian believers, you haven't failed. You're not weak in your faith because of these difficulties. In fact, it's evidence that your faith is genuine and strong. Paul says, your trouble, it's normal. Jesus taught us, in this world, you will have tribulation. And the second word of comfort he gives to them is he assures them that God will take care of this, that God will judge those who are persecuting them. Right? He says, um, that wrath has come upon them to the uttermost, verse 16. God will judge. Why is that comforting? Because it means the Thessalonians don't have to worry about seeking their own justice. They can have free hearts. They can entrust that God sees them and that even though they're being persecuted, it's not because God's abandoned them or forgot or doesn't care. Paul assures them the Lord will judge. They are judged to the uttermost. He will bring justice on your behalf. I think the key truth for us in these few verses here is, is to recognize what a powerful thing Paul does. When he acknowledges their persecution, he tells them that it's normal. And that God sees and will take care of it. Why is that so powerful? Because what Paul is communicating to them, what we should understand from this, is that salvation is a common experience. Hey, Thessalonians, you're not off track. This is normal. Sometimes we just need to know what's happening to us is normal because it doesn't feel normal in the moment. It's uncomfortable. But guess what? Salvation and the Christian life are a common experience. They're not unique. It's not like you have a Christian experience and then you have a Christian experience and then they have a Christian experience and they're all sort of like hand-tailored by God. In some respects, your life is tailored. But in all the important ways, everything is common. We're all saved the same way. We're all saved from the same things. We're all saved to the same inheritance. And we all have common experiences in the faith. It's like, it's like when you start driving and you're new to cars and then one day your check engine light comes on and you freak out. Oh my gosh, the check engine light's on. I don't know what to do. You're calling people, right? And then after you've been around for a while, you realize that's a normal experience. The check engine light, it just comes on. And it might mean something and it probably doesn't. But unless a wheel's falling off or the thing's dying in an intersection, you probably don't have to worry about it. It's a common experience, right? When you wake up after your 40th birthday and something hurts for no reason and you freak out, after a few years, you realize, oh, this is just normal. Because I'm over 40. It's a normal, it's a common experience. Sometimes we just need to remember that. Listen, push back. Disrupted relationships, being slighted by someone because of your faith, being mocked at work or school. These are all pretty mild, by the way, but they are also totally normal. If you live for Jesus and live by his ethics and speak his name, and are public about your worship. Totally normal. 1 Peter 4.16, we looked at this in men's group last night. Great tie-in. Peter says, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. 
The world wants to shame you. Peter says, don't be ashamed if you're getting persecuted. Glorify God. It's a common experience. Hey, Thessalonians, you're right where you're supposed to be. Maybe you're going through something really tough. Maybe there's pushback. And you're just like, am I off track? Did God forget me? Listen, it's a common faith. It's a common experience. It's happened to others. You know what the blessing of, of, of it being a common experience is? If they're, if they're normal struggles? Listen to this. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Let me read that again. No temptation has overtaken you, su ex overtaken you except such as is common. It's all common. And if it's all common, that means it's all covered. It happened to somebody else and God got them through it. And it's happening to you and the Lord will get you through it. So be encouraged. Don't freak out because the check engine light's on. It's a normal thing, all right? He will see us through. All right, the third part of our passage, the final part, starts in verse 17. It says, But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus that is coming? For you are our glory and joy. Man, what love. You, you, thinking back to what we first talked about, right? Sort of the, the, the bubbling papa, <laughs> you know? The proud parent. You are our glory and our joy. That's how I feel about my kids. Right? That's where Paul is. He wants to assure them that even though he hasn't been able to come back personally to visit them in their trouble, it's not from a lack of, of desire. Right? He wants to come. He says, but we were hindered by Satan. He's just explaining. Hindered by Satan. What does that mean? Hindered by Satan. How could Paul, the great apostle, be hindered by Satan? Well, look, old Satan has been doing the same things for a very long time. He's always been and always will be until he's finally cast into the lake of fire, trying to hinder God's work. That's, that's his MO. He, he's trying to monkey up the gears. Listen to 1 Peter 5.8. Peter warns us, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, he walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Ephesians 6, the Apostle Paul tells us, verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts, the word host is armies, right? Of wickedness in the heavenly places. There's a spiritual adversary, there's a spiritual battle. Paul says we were hindered by Satan. He recognized that his inability to go visit the Thessalonians was because Satan was preventing him. Now, how do we know, or how did Paul know, that in this instance, this bit of trouble was the direct result of Satan's activity and not just maybe the Lord prohibiting him because you know it was something he wasn't supposed to do at that time or whatever? Well, first and foremost, when we kind of try to evaluate these things, you know, what's our desire? Is it good? Is it biblical? Is it from the Lord or is it from us? You know, we're trying to do something. We're not able to do it. Well, is this, is Satan hindering me? Well, this was obviously a good desire, a godly desire. But Paul had a conviction and a witness that this was God's leading. God said, no, it's good. It's good for you to go. I want you to go. And he wasn't able to. And obviously Paul felt confirmed by the Holy Spirit in some way that this was the case. How do we discern that kind of, those kinds of things? I'm going to give you the pastoral answer that nobody likes. You just got to pray about it. You just got to pray. But we can ask for wisdom, right? Come boldly to the throne of grace to ask for help in time of need. 
right? Those who lack wisdom, let them ask, for God gives it abundantly. Lord, is this my thing or your thing? You know, Paul understood by the, I believe, the, the revelation of the Holy Spirit that this was God's thing, but Satan was, was, was hindering. So the important thing for us to get out of this passage, I believe, is what did Paul do when Satan hindered him? He pushed ahead. He couldn't visit them, so he wrote a letter to them. He communicated in another way. Now, commentators, this is not my original idea, so I'm giving credit where credit's due, but commentators have noted that this, the first Thessalonians may likely be the very first letter written by the Apostle Paul to a church. And so, if that's the case, it certainly could be that when Satan hindered him from making a physical visit, he decided to write a letter, which would become the first of many letters, which would compose the, a, a significant portion of the teaching of the New Testament. So why would God, perhaps, allow Satan to hinder the work of the Apostle Paul? In the words of Joseph to his brothers, what you meant for evil, God has worked for good. God meant for good. It could be that this was the impetus for Paul to start writing letters, preserving the teaching of the apostles for the rest of the church age for us. How incredible is that? See, God has purposes. Satan has some ability and some opportunity, but he's always on a leash. And God is always at work to work all things together for good. All right? So when we face spiritual resistance, what do we do? We pray. And we push forward in whatever ways God allows and the Spirit enables. We don't give up. We continue to do his work and see how he's going to work things together for good. So this is what Paul does. And just that whole thing there, he says, at the end, you are our glory and joy. Again, just sort of bubbling over like a spiritual dad. You know, John wrote, the Apostle John wrote and said, you know, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. You are our glory and joy. He also says, Paul, in, this, in these verses, he says, you are our crown of rejoicing. Crown of rejoicing. That we may present you. I'm just going to have to go back and read it again. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? It's you in the presence of Jesus. That's what I'm excited about. That's what I'm looking forward to. Hey, again, here's another reference to, to being in the presence of the Lord, the, the return of Jesus in the book. We see it kind of at the end of every chapter. It's right here. This is one of Paul's motivations. He says, I can't wait to see you in the presence of Jesus. You're our crown of rejoicing. It, it's sort of like, You are, our, you are the reward of my labor and love for Jesus. You are the thing I get to offer to my Savior. You are the result of his blessing, my efforts to work in his name. It's like Paul saying, I don't need a mansion in heaven. I got you. I don't need a crown in glory. I've got you. Isn't that amazing? We could ask, and rightly so, how is it that Paul had such a passion for people? I mean, I like people. I mean, some people. Sometimes. <laughs> but this is incredible affection. What's the secret? A big part of it is that Paul is motivated, his heart is motivated by seeing people in the light of eternity. It's eternity that's important. It's their presence in eternity that's important. And that drives him and motivates him. But I think there's something else. He has this love for people. Now look, the evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. By your love for one another, they will know that you are my disciples, Jesus said. It's love. So we have the love of God has been spread abroad in our hearts, Paul says in Romans. 
If you don't love the brethren, you don't love God, John says in his first letter. Right? So there's this love that's in us by virtue of the presence of the Holy Spirit. But there's something else. I think one of the reasons that Paul's love is so extreme and his affection is so off the charts is because he's always cultivating that love. He's always investing in those people. He's serving them. He's pouring out his life for them. Jesus says, where your treasure is, where your investment is, there your heart will be also. And so he's been pouring out his life into these people and investing in them. And so his affection and his attachment to them are, are just insane. It's just amazing. You're my crown. I'll sleep on the streets of gold and not have a mansion. I don't need one. My paraphrase. Because you're my crown of rejoicing. You're my reward. You're my joy. You're my glory. It's amazing. I think the encouragement for us is we always have opportunities to cultivate that love by serving other people and investing in them and encouraging them and serving them and praying for them. And uh, you're like, well, I don't know, Pastor, I'm just not feeling it today. Yeah, I may not be either. But we just have the opportunity. It's there for us to lay up treasure in heaven, to lay up treasure in souls that they might be in heaven with us, right? We can cultivate that heart of Christ, that love of God for other people. And we just see it sort of spilling out of Paul in this letter his love for them. The power of the gospel. Pretty cool little picture of how the faithful proclaiming of the word of God takes root in the hearts of people and brings forth this incredible transformation and explodes really in this, this, this love that exists in the family of God. And it, that'll sort of be the theme. Brotherly love will be the theme in the next chapter as we look at it in our next study. Amen.